Hello all you textual deviants and welcome to season 3 episode 4 of Texting with me Tomek in St. Petersburg. And with me Mark Will in Taipei. What's our topic today? Our topic is not a film, it is not a piece of art or a song. It is a concept experience known as high school friendship. Um, I had some profound and intimate connections at that age. And uh, as I grow older, I sometimes feel rueful that I don't have similar types of friendships. I won't say that my friendships are necessarily inadequate could just say that they're different but the level of as i said intimacy um daily kind of face-to-face -face connection that certainly isn't there and part of that is because of my troubadour lifestyle but uh it's also perhaps a phenomenon of being an adult or living in 2024. So lots of different reasons why I don't enjoy that type of connection anymore. Uh, but anyway, for me, it's an interesting topic. I hope it is for you too, Mark. What is your initial response to the topic? Well, I mean, my teenage years were not terribly pleasant. I have a lot of bad memories about that time and in fact i would say that i didn't really find peace and happiness until i discovered drugs quite honestly like uh once i once i started uh experimenting with marijuana and lsd i i think i saw like um a way out of my misery during that period, of course, also music helped. And, and I think drugs and music were like, uh, you know, similar, uh, projects or, or they were like mutually reinforcing one another. And so the, the friendships that I built around, um, those two activities were probably the most significant for me but that was like in high school middle school was a different story but like uh i was beginning to rebel against everything uh in the later years of middle school or as we called it intermediate school and by my freshman year of high school i was completely in in open rebellion against everything you know so okay yeah so my, my my i was an outcast among outcasts but um i i did make some friends among the other uh high school misfits and losers yeah because i mean not to confirm the loser part but uh often relationships among outsiders tend to be the strongest. I remember recently just hearing Andre from Outcast talk about, you know, his connection with Big Boy and, uh, and they created the dungeon and the, the music that followed. It's obviously incredible. So that wouldn't necessarily indicate any lack of depth in your connections, even if you were struggling emotionally. Do you feel like the connections that you forged at that time were powerful? Yeah, I mean, especially because the people I was associating with were, they had the same interests. Like, you know, we were taking drugs and playing music together. So we're, we're like collaborators, we're, we're creating things together. We're really trying to do something musically and so yeah that it was quite an inspiring time and um there there are good memories associated with that of course the the band project fell to pieces later so there was some disappointment as well but um 
certainly those times were more exciting and enjoyable than say the earlier years of mm. middle school when I was still trying to be a good boy, you know, following the, the wishes of my parents and, um, society and school teachers and so on. Right. But once I, once I, um, jettison those expectations I, I feel like there was a kind of awakening and so that you know before that the friendships i had were with all of the other good boys and girls uh and uh i guess i quickly realized that if you don't go along if you don't conform to all of those absurd expectations which they pretend they are opposed to you know they pretend that they rebel against those but if you actually do rebel in the way that i did like if you really openly challenge them and really refuse to go along and refuse to conform you're quickly banished from the inner circle so um can you I be more specific I, about the types of things you you felt compelled to rebel against Well, I mean, I guess I just uh, saw the pointlessness of all of it. Like, um, why am I studying at school? What's the point of of getting good grades? What's the point of, um, you know, trying to be a part of this uh, American society, trying to be successful and um fit in and do all the things that are going to get me pats on the back. Like why I'm not, I don't, this is not who I am. I don't want to be this person. Fuck all this. You know, and I think we're a nice example of yin yang in that sense, because you know, a lot of what you're saying, I experienced very differently. Um, I was kind of nerdy in some way. Uh, me and my two best friends, Carl and Richard, I was going to use pseudonyms, but it's too hard in my head when I'm on the spot. But uh, yeah, we all cared a lot about academics and uh, about university. and But we did find ways to kind of still express our individuality. Uh, Hip hop became a major source of connection for us. And that was like a small expression of rebellion because the kind of group, I think that was the dominant group in our advanced classes, they were more like the preps um, who dressed more like Abercrombie and listened to more quote unquote, like white music. And uh, so, yeah, hip hop was massively important. Uh, my friend Richard and I were hip hop dancers. So we kind of experienced it not only at school, but outside of school, we got to meet different types of people than we associated with at high school, older people, people into break dancing. Uh, but yeah, in terms of, you know, even just thinking about now, like I'm the teacher who's like, <laughs> pushing my kids to get every assignment in, you know, and to go for the A. So it's not really, but again, it's not an either or in terms of like what's good or not good, you know? Uh, but I would say the aspects of school that were really compelling to me was English class, for example. Like I, I especially loved my junior and senior English teacher. Um, I just felt that these were the types of adults that I respected. They were teaching me to question things and uh, they loved literature. And I, I felt that and, and they were just like, uh, yeah, they were just a, willing to really connect with me. And yeah, so, so I always respond to, to literature above all else. But anyway, um, what I thought we could maybe start with today is 
just a a brief character portrait of a couple people that you were close with, maybe how they differed from you as well as how they were similar to you, like and what the dynamic between the two of you was um and just like maybe the highs and the lows of one or two particular friendships if you have somebody that you could bring to mind right now if i ask you on the spot well i'm thinking of uh my primary collaborator in the musical project i alluded to i won't mention his name but um you know we were quite consumed with this uh, band that we had, right? And so we spent all our time um, making music, writing songs, trying to, uh, jamming, uh, trying to um, book gigs, you know? What was the name of the band? Making, Making plans to record an album which he, which we eventually did making plans to move to austin which which didn't happen um the name of the band was contrast that was what we ended up calling ourselves okay nice it was Blakey like and a, inspired yeah well <laughs> more like pink floyd and the beatles and zz top and led zeppelin um well i just meant in terms of the name of the of the band but uh yeah do you have like an origin story for how you two initially met and well we had your no, first I, hangouts we had were known, like well we had known each other since um elementary school i think uh and his stepsister took piano lessons from my mother so you know i knew him from the neighborhood i knew him and his family, but we didn't really become close until we, um, I guess, when was it? Were we 14, I guess? Uh, probably the first year of high school. We both were taking guitar lessons from the same wonderful teacher. Now you, you mentioned adult mentors, nobody at school. Uh, I didn't respect any teacher at school i thought they were all idiots and i wanted nothing to do with any of them i thought they were all just feeding me bullshit but looking back I, do you feel my, like you were overly harsh not really no i i looking back i think maybe i was <laughs> i should have been more dismissive of of some of those people like they were they were like you know not only worthless but harmful in many ways um but this guitar teacher was i think i mentioned him before in the um when we did the jeff beck episode in season two but um yeah he was uh he was a wonderful mentor for both of us uh, a great guitarist taught us a lot about the instrument taught us a lot about music theory and he was just a kind good man you know he was just a good male role model for uh teenage kids um and so i think we we Where did the studied with take him place? there's a local music store and, i was gonna uh, say like a guitar center or something that's what i imagined yeah yeah, it was a local music store, and he gave lessons in the in one of the back practice rooms. And um, you know, th this other kid that I knew from elementary school, um, and I saw each other at lessons, and we started talking, and then we started jamming together, and we would try to apply what we learned. Right, like one of us would play the the chords and the other would try to solo like over the the scales we were learning and and we quickly realized we can create music of our own you know and so nice. we just we just 
uh, we're so eager to learn more and more. And we, we compared influences. We had different influences, but like we, we like learn from one another and we learn from records and we learn from our teacher. And I think after we, we got more into drugs, we stopped the lessons. We felt like, you know, we can take it from here. Like after we got the foundation from our teacher, we just went off in all kinds of directions on our own. Um, but he went so to the same was, school as you, right? Yeah, yeah, we were in the same high school. Did he also and, drop out? Uh, I think he ended up finishing, but, you know, <laughs> not with honors, let's put it that way. And and every day was the same. Like, uh, we we did, there was a music theory course, but, you know, every day we would show up stoned. Like, it was in the afternoon, and so at lunchtime we would go out to the parking lot and get high, and then we'd go to music theory class and learn about the mixolydian mode while uh baked uh, but did you guys do that, it like with with gusto yeah some of that was youth uh, some of that was useful but you know the music theory guy was a um was a choir teacher and he you know his interests certainly weren't the same as ours but he was a he was a nice man i I won't say that you know his influence was harmful we we probably could have really been better liked students my, my choir teacher mr gray yeah. he was a gay guy uh but uh yeah passionate about music you know like it's it was his his thing and he was a very talented yeah guy like songwriter and, and so on well i mean i took what i could from that but more than anything i wanted to quit as soon as possible and you know my plan was to just focus on music take the band to austin and uh you know see what happened with our with our some other band members obviously in tow yeah and they all punked out and so um i was left with a demo and i i could have gone to Austin myself, but I, I sort of felt deflated and demoralized. So I, I, you know, ended up not doing that, but um, getting more into n- not going to Austin and trying to start a new band or make it as a songwriter or what, whatever vague plan I had. But instead, I, I got more into literature and um you know studying so right went a different right. went a different way but yeah the those those uh were important to my formation i guess those those years when um we were focused on the high school band cool so for me, I had like two important figures, as I said, Richard and Carl. And uh, I don't know if I've talked to you about them before, but Richard was a uh, Baptist. Um, he attended like a quite significant church in Phoenix called North Phoenix Baptist. And uh, I had like huge admiration for him as a human being because he was so stable um and uh he yeah he never got ruffled he was very moral but not in an obnoxious way at all like humble as well he had like a slight lisp um and uh he excelled kind of at everything but didn't stand out at things um he was just like a very yeah even keel respectful it's i i guess the thing that alarmed me was just like how he was able to not not really kind of lose it about anything and Mm -hmm. because i was kind of the opposite i was emotional i was writing journals i was 
fretting about girls all the time, you know, and like we would talk on the phone for a long time, maybe an hour or two, and majority of it would be me kind of like expressing the woes of existence, you know, <laughs> and him kind of like maybe consoling me or something like that. So we had Richard. This is on a landline, right? Yeah, on a landline, time. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the bullet points on our list that, you know, I posted on Substack. How you and your friends com communicated. That's what yeah. we asked yeah. subscribers to talk about. It was the same for me, like whether we're talking about middle school or high school, always the landline, right? Because it was before cell phones in my day. And um, the if we if we weren't able to meet in person and hang out like that's what it was we talk on the phone and uh there were multiple phones in our in my parents house right like there was an upstairs phone there's one in the kitchen one in my parents bedroom so right. there was always an issue with uh you know which phone I was on and, and whether right. someone was listening in because my mom had a habit of trying to eavesdrop, right? Like, like, uh, uh, she would answer the phone and in, in her room and I'd be upstairs. I'd say, okay, I got it. And then I'd wait for the click. Right. right, so right, right. She would hang up, but I could hear she was still on there. I'd say, <laughs> I got it. I got it, mom. And then, right. you know, one time, I thought she had hung up and she heard me talking about <clears throat> something that uh, I certainly didn't want her to hear. And it caused a lot of trouble, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a teenage memory, like trying to have a private conversation and being like spied on by parents. And also though, like the fact that I would talk to another male for more than an hour, you know, the, but no ever thought of like any kind of gay vibes with that, you know, it's just hearts to hearts going for such long periods. I mean, you could say that you we're, mean we like do that. we're doing now. <laughs> exactly. But now, but we do it with the pretense of like the publishing stuff. Right. But, but I don't know. Yeah. Like I don't, that's another point is that I don't talk to people besides my wife much i talk to people at work and i am lucky i'm blessed to have a lot of colleagues who i can have pretty meaningful conversations with but because i'm kind of a workaholic like i don't usually like to linger too long anyway so it's like uh yeah and i've got the podcast as like one means of having an extended conversation but that's another thing that's just like gone right well Compared i to think that time. that's i think that's changed due to technology i mean another a friend from high school i've mentioned him before and i can mention him by name because he's my sometime co-author gj via um you know we when i was still in the states we would talk regularly on the phone even when i was in houston and he was in chicago or or wherever we were uh, and then even after I left the States, um, we would Skype at least once a month, I would say. But, uh, you know, that doesn't happen very often. It's all texting now. Texting. Right, texting right, right. like we're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah, we text each other and rarely we have an actual conversation. I mean... And, and I think uh, there was a period when we would email a lot, right? Like we, we actually wrote, we spent time writing letters to each other with, with complete paragraphs. and For sure. You know, I used to write a lot of emails. Yeah, yeah. And, and that just doesn't happen anymore. I mean, now that I have a sub stack, I'm emailing subscribers right but um it's it's certainly different like texting it's very different. Has, I mean, it's... has definitely um changed the way we communicate with friends and i think probably is it texting though i mean is it 
texting like the fact that we text that person or is it the fact that we just have so much stimulation now and different ways of getting stimulation from our phones and so on that we just don't set aside that type of time anymore it's like not well i think it's i think it's both i mean um the technology incur encourages a kind of laziness and a um you know casual attitude i mean i never my imagined... point is sorry to interrupt you but like you're not having because you could if you were having the same length and the same depth of conversation on text then i don't think it would be as much of an issue but when but you say you just text the, now not, you're just that's not how it is exactly the, the text the medium the medium is the message as right marshall McLuhan would say right like the 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 text format does not encourage long form communication you could do it you could do it but um you know you're gonna get a tl uh dr too long don't read didn't read or whatever i don't even know what that fucking abbreviation means right tl <laughs> semicolon dr too long didn't read you know and, <laughs> or we reply with like a an emoji you know like yeah there's and we a, like each other's of, messages <laughs> yeah we like it we give it a thumbs up that is like i mean i do it but i can't say i approve of it exactly i do it too i'm i'm just as guilty and we we've all fallen into that and i can remember it wasn't that long ago when we were communicating through email like lengthy emails like i right, was you were spending saying an that hour way. yeah <clears throat> no it's sure. an hour writing an email to a close friend for um, sure go to an internet cafe when we're traveling and catch up on your emails right exactly emails. even when i was with you in russia i remember sitting there and writing to sujong or writing to my uncle and i did the same thing yeah yeah and that wasn't so long ago but who does that now i mean i will sometimes say i do but i blame the fact that i'm a workaholic and i'm not even a workaholic i just think i have a nine to five is the point and i think that's the main thing if i didn't have a nine to five if i was like in the summer or something when i'm not working i'm all about lengthier experiences you know when i was in egypt i managed to do the the letter every day kind of project and so that's my excuse mm -hmm. and i imagine that for other people especially fathers or mothers that's just i mean i'm not either of those obviously considering being a mother in the future but yeah you should try that <laughs> but but you get the point like that's more a phenomenon of adulthood or like work uh, workhood you know i mean yeah but i i do think the technology has had a huge influence sure sure it's a you, it's a choice yeah. it's a choice but also it's not you know like we're being herded into this <clears throat> type of uh i don't know relating to other people right like if we want to be part of the the contemporary world like by default we almost have to participate in this although you know i have a a friend a new friend that communicates only by email i think he has a phone but you know he he likes to communicate by email so that's well and i've got a friend aiden who friend of the show his main way of like of communicating through whatsapp is through voice messages you know yeah so and i think that's yeah. cool I don't, yeah there's i don't that know too. if he does it for humanity or i mean for for as like uh or if it's just his just more comfortable for him but it's i can be quite nice that can be quite nice as well um there was a book called Mega Trends. Um, I guess it came out in the 80s and it talked about this concept of high tech, high touch, right? Like the more tech 
uh, that's that's uh, in our lives, the more we need like the human contact. So it's really meaningful when in this day of texting, I mean, even more so now than in the 80s, right? Like at that time, it was fax machines or whatever. But now just imagine when you get like a handwritten letter, what a rarity that is, mm. you know, and it's so much more meaningful. Right. So I'll come back to painting a portrait, if you don't mind, of a couple people. So we've got Richard, right, on the one hand. And I wanted to just mention his kind of religious aspect as well a little bit more, just because one kind of current of our friendship that always troubled me a little bit was that this wasn't something that he went out and proclaimed, but I knew that one of the beliefs of his faith was that only Christians go to heaven. And I just remember as a fellow idealist in a way, because I felt like that's even that's kind of an idealist position. Um, I just was always bothered by that. You know, it just didn't sit right with me morally. And, and I remember trying to kind of challenge him on it through moral grounds, you know, just using classic arguments like, well, these people, do you really expect this person to be a Christian when they grow up in this society and so on into this religion? They better be, and, or they're going to burn. Well, well, the thing is with him, right? Like, because he, he was like such a good person, it would never be with that energy that he would respond. It was just like, he wanted to be a good person and for him, he should follow what his church leaders and the Bible are saying. So it's almost like he was, he would, he didn't even want to believe that. That's kind of what I felt from him, but he kind of felt like this is what I signed up for. And I would be going against, I wouldn't be nice. You know, if I like, or, so it's just like, he had to believe it. He never argued it with, with like negative energy towards the person, you know? So that's just interesting for a human to this all I'm trying to say is like this incarnation of human is was an interesting one, you know, and he's still a a great. I mean, I he's still cool about communicating, like as opposed to other people. Like I still want to talk to him, and I actually so you're noticed still that I, in touch. Kind of like I just realized that I had missed an email from him from uh, a few months back, which I regret. So now I've tried to reach out to him again, but yeah, I think like there's no beef between us and. We're both like gen generally affable people who like want to get along. So it's like and is we, and he we're still a and, fundamentalist or yeah, uh huh. And he's got kids, but again, like he had aspects of his personality that were really cool, considering kind of his like white bread upbringing. You know, like the fact that he started taking hip hop dance classes with me. Whereas his family was just like a, you know, a football, basketball type of family. And that, that wouldn't be, that wasn't like the, the normal thing to do, but he did it. And like, I got, he got super into Michael Jackson, like because of me and, uh, and in, into rap music, you know, he got really into it. So yeah, like I give him a lot of credit. I managed to sway him on one issue, for example, the death penalty. That was like a kind of seminal moment when he was just like, yeah, I, I compelled him to believe, to take my position. And another thing, one of the most like beautiful moments of my relationship with him and my friend Carl was we all read Malcolm X, our junior year of high school, and it like moved us all. And we gave this like really impassioned presentation. And yeah, so that was an interesting way that we connected again is through our love of hip hop. And maybe that transcended into some like, literature to some extent and uh yeah we love just playing basketball like i don't know if you played sports with your friends but basketball was just an hours and hours and hours after school activity you know just inventing our own games playing one-on-one -on -one, playing one-on-one -on -one tournaments three-point contests horse so many different like variations but Absolutely. great ways to spend afternoons yeah, before before music and drugs, it was all sports, baseball, soccer, basketball, you know. 
football and, not not with pads and helmets i didn't right play football you know at school but you know nerf nerf football in the yard but yeah mostly baseball and soccer that i did play at school uh again before <laughs> before music and drugs became you know i primary concerns but uh yeah i'm looking at the list here um and thinking of trying to think of one crazy anecdote of an experience you had with friends in your teens i don't know if this is crazy but like there was a period when mostly middle school i think like we were into various forms of vandalism like it began with with uh wrapping people's houses you know tping yeah we called it wrapping but yes tping really? toilet papering yeah we're gonna wrap let's wrap her house let's wrap his house <laughs> was and, that like your term then no that was just a you know southeast texas term interesting yeah because oh, oh, tping man, was massive my, though for my, us my house got wrapped last night I know who did it too. We're going to, we're going to get them next weekend or whatever. And so that was a, that was a big thing, right? Like you, you, you get on your dark clothing, you go out, you sneak out after midnight, you got your rolls of toilet paper that you've stolen from the, from the bathroom of the house where you're spending the night, whether it's yours or your, your friends, you've got some shaving cream too. You know, and so we would we would like use the shaving cream to spray messages on the driveway or on the car. And um, I mean, it got to the point where um, we didn't even know people that well, uh, certain people that well, like they weren't even friends. But it's just like, I want to I want to wrap someone's house or car. And so we would just like just uh spray shaving cream on the the car across the street is insane and then it got like more extreme like we would burn we would burn old um tennis shoes right like we would we would spray paint them and then light them um we would egg houses and cars like we would we would jump up out of the bushes and throw an egg at, at a car. I mean, dangerous stuff. Someone could have a fucking accident. And one yeah, time, yeah. one time we, we got were eggs like, once, and I was not, I was not okay with that. I mean, I think I felt like that was crossing a line. Yeah, we, well, we we went to those extremes. One time we were like running around, um, hiding in bushes. I don't know what we were gonna do. Maybe knock on some doors and run away right ring a doorbell and and uh run away before they they answer we did that doorbell ditching i believe is the term yeah well there's another uh southeast texas term that's a bit more offensive but anyway okay. um yeah we did that one time to the house of a uh, of a young man who ended up chasing us and he caught my friend i i got away but he caught my friend and he he grabbed him by the collar and said uh, don't ever do it again and my friend was scared shitless this boy was older turns out this young man ended up uh being one of the most notorious murderers in u.s history like he moved up north and he he tunneled under his neighbor's house and um uh tortured and murdered her in her basement <laughs> this, this is this is, the, this, is a, this is a true story this is a true this story is the guy who grabbed your friend yeah not your friend yeah and this kid was horribly bullied in high school this is where i came from he was horribly bullied in high school to such an extent that he wouldn't even like use his locker because the the football players he was a total this is the killer we're talking about yeah he was a total nerd um misfit freak and not like 
the kind that would hang out in the boys' room smoking and taking drugs, but just like a very strange character bullied relentlessly by the football players and the jocks, the assholes. Um, they would, they would, uh, you know, put things in his locker. They would steal things from his locker. He complained to the school authorities. They did nothing. So he started carrying around his books in a box, you know, like he would go from class to class with all his fucking books in a Damn. cardboard box. And one time, one of the football players um, caught him on the stairwell, pushed him down the stairs. You know, he fell down, all his books scattered everywhere. The school authorities did nothing. Oh, it's just the jocks. They're just having fun. Kid grows up to be a a murderer and I think <laughs> rapist. He was, you can you can find videos of this guy on America's Most Wanted or something, you know. Like, Thanks uh, for listening to Texting, Season 3, Episode 4. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a, I mean, it's a, it's a true story. I believe uh, you, bro. And uh, so anyway, we we were involved in that kind of thing. And I remember one time, I guess we were, I don't know what we were doing. We were just involved in, you know, one of our night raids. Like we would just go out and try to find trouble and um i was like hiding in some bushes and uh this spotlight shines on me and um it's the cops and um i came out with my hands up and he says you don't know <laughs> hands up don't shoot you don't know how close you came to getting shot right now <laughs> and i was like oh apparently a cop had gotten shot and they were looking for the shooter and so they almost shot me thinking that Damn, i was son. yeah so that happened in my little southeast texas community um all right i'm gonna jump in with character profile number two okay you're gonna just all right cut well, me what off do you want there me to do? well <laughs> carry on all right so we've got richard the christian fundamentalist then the other part of the triangle is carl who Today is the communicator of WhatsApp, director of communication for WhatsApp. Okay. Uh, so I grew up with someone who, yeah, he was from like a, an affluent Jewish family, um, which in a sense is interesting just because I look back on it now differently than how I experienced it at the time. Like I'm able to kind of just see things i don't want to say like more perceptibly but anyway he was a conservative jew i don't know if you know like the rankings of judaism in terms of there's like reform is the most chilled out and then conservative then orthodox so he's conservative he's a little ben um, shapiro <laughs> i don't want to say that because i mean again this was he was my life you know he was my life for many years because i had basically the same friend group from third grade until i graduated high school Mm -hmm. um, and we were like pretty devoted friends, uh, a few ups and downs, but with me and Richard, it was very, very consistent. And then the third member of our group would sometimes vary, but yeah, I mean, with Carl, it's just interesting because he's, he worked for, first of all, he became the president of Boston university, uh, like the student, student government. Student body president. Student body. Then he was... Not like the dean. No, but he's approaching that type of lifestyle. I mean, he then... I don't know exactly you know his career trajectory, but uh, you can find his stuff on the government websites because he was former deputy assistant to the Secretary of Defense for communications. Uh, so... Yeah, he worked in D.C. a lot. Um, he received the Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service. Um, the Department of Defense's highest civilian honor. He worked, I guess, closely with... He previously served as the Deputy Spokesman for Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. So, uh, yeah, and 
Are you trying to it's impress just, me because it's having no, the opposite no, I, effect? I know it's not. I, I know that's not going to impress you, but it's just interesting, right? That that's like that was my best friend for nine years, right? I mean, I've just got some like, and I told you one of my other good. Well, that's let's just side that. But uh, what I wanted to say, one little interesting anecdote I have is that our senior year of high school, I remember him kind of organizing what you could say was just like a Zionist charity day where he brought in educational materials. Like our school cooperated with it and he somehow managed to organize this thing. And like the whole school was like shut down for a couple of days while he, he sponsored this program of like tolerance and understanding, which I think had a very like Holocaust centered theme. And I don't want to be overly cynical about it now, but I can't help but feel a little bit like, wow, this is really like part of a larger Zionist project, you know, because uh, he was the president of United Synagogue Youth uh, of his like region at the time. So he was every couple of weeks, he'd be going to LA for conferences. And an interesting thing is he was very much like a Monday to Friday friend. Friday night, he'd be what celebrating Passover. Is that what they do every Friday? I sound horrible right now, but Shabbat, Shabbat, and uh, he would never be like doing the sleepover thing with me and Richard. Like he had his own vibe on the weekends, you know. And Monday to Friday was back on. Uh, but yeah, it's just. I guess the one thing I want to add is like, the first time I tried to hang out with him at university, I had already started to change. You know, like I started becoming more like rebellious and bohemian my freshman year in high school. And I started high school pretty young. So I was 17 when I, when I started, sorry, when I started university, I was 17. So like, that's when I started smoking weed and like, just kind of like I was released from this, these two friendships that were very follow the rules in certain ways. Right. Like conservative. Jew. Yeah. Although I didn't really necessarily feel like I, I feel blessed in many ways to have had these two friendships, but but so anyway, I came back to Phoenix and we hung out and it was just like so apparent that we were very different. And I remember being pretty upset with the way he hang he acted the first time we hung out. Like I just felt like he had a lot of kind of ego. Uh the way he talked to like a girl at the mall, like he kind of I think he gave her his business card and he was just trying to act like super suave and I was just not in that vibe at all. I was trying to like become more yeah, alternative as I said and it was kind of depressing and we lost touch, you know, I think we hung out one more time when I was canvassing for the DNC for in 2004 or so I was canvassing for Carrie. You're admitting it's like my that first publicly. Job. It was a pretty bohemian job. Actually, it basically consisted of like walking around in Tucson, Arizona in the summer in the fucking heat begging for money. I know it was ridiculous looking back, but at the time it was pretty wild in terms of just the day to day experience. But, uh, yeah, I, I did, and I just met him, and he was already just so suit-established, like, and cocky, I would say, you know? And I just didn't like that vibe at all. But it's just weird, too, like, how inaccessible he feels now as a human being to me, you know? Like, I just wouldn't even reach out to him, despite him being so significant to my life for that period. That's just weird. So, do you have any... Not to like be too like, oh, talk about me, but do you have any response to this like triad that I've described? Is there anything like, whether it's a cynical response or positive, I don't know, or contrast to you or anything? Well, I think they were just, you're just looking back and recognizing their contribution to your life at that time, but you've moved on and you're a different person now. Um, and I think it's good to let go, to recognize that people might mean something to you at a certain time of your life, but it's not necessarily forever and that's okay. There must be something beautiful though about being close with someone who you were friends with when you were 10. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, mean, I have that a little bit with Christy, but we don't really 
talk much anymore. Yeah. Well, What's your longest lasting? Is is with the guy you mentioned? I guess the guitarist, right? No, I have no contact with him now. I haven't talked to him ah, in really? years. No. Oh shit! My bad. No. G.J. Via, my sometime co-author. We're okay. And we're you still, met him in high school or in teenage I, years? I met him when I was uh, in pre-K. We went to the same pre-K. I've known him since then. We haven't always been close. Like we went to different elementary schools, but we met again in middle school and we were friends in high school and we became, we bonded in our college years. We were, we went to different universities, but you know, we would always meet um, during the holidays and we bonded over our mutual love of literature. Uh, and so, you know, we've we've always read books together we went to ireland together in search of james joyce and we've been working on a series of novelettes about that trip and all of all of it all that that trip entailed and meant for us um, do you feel like maybe he knows you better than anyone anyone in on this earth well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, well, no. who does then? Well, not a male friend. That would be a female friend. I would say, you know, there's certain. Despite the fact that you haven't been with your female friend for the same duration of time, that's my main point. If someone, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how valuable it is to make those comparisons, but they're just certain levels of I'm not saying like your that, best friend I'm saying no, someone I'm who saying, can like I'm just saying on, there, there are levels of intimacy that that uh you know I don't share with male friends and there's I don't know a kind of platon uh, platonic intimacy that um I wouldn't necessarily have with female friends although it's not impossible you know, it's just, there's just a different I still feel dynamic. like you didn't really, like, I still feel like that's not necessarily uh, contradicting my question, though. Because like, okay. I'm not saying the person you love the most. I'm saying the person who knows you the best. Well, what part knows what part of me? You know, like... that. That's true, but I'm just saying, like... My whole point is, like, I meet people now. Sorry, I'm just going to go on for just a second. Like, I meet people now who, at work, like Carlos. I think Carlos is awesome, and I we get along really well. But we don't have an opportunity because of him being a father, our schedules. We don't have the opportunity to really create the kind of friendship that I used to have. You know, like, we, again... That's not me trying to like go and get treat have you be my psychologist or something. I'm just saying that, and, and this is a cliche that people say it's harder to create friendships when you get older. And my point is that if somebody has seen where you grew up, for example, they know what it's like to grow up there. Yeah, I guess a sibling is often the person who ends up being the person that we feel like <laughs> we probably have the. I get put it this way, maybe it's just about reference points. They will understand not, your reference points. Not for me. Not for me in terms of siblings but okay but reference I, I've ne yeah i don't accept that i we saw that kind of thing in korea right like the the people who were classmates like the whole the whole concept of the classmate was so important the person that they went to kindergarten with and and grew up with and then they meet later and they feel all sentimental because they went to school with each other. Oh, that's my classmate. I, I'm i sorry. That just doesn't have the same sentimental value to me. Maybe, maybe because I hated school so much, you know, it's like, I don't give a shit about that. There, there are other ways of connecting that are more important to me. It's shared interests and yeah, background is, is important, but there are a lot of people from the, area where i grew up with that have similar reference points and n would know what i'm talking about when i talk about 
certain things related to that particular place. But, uh, you know, I have no desire to connect with them. I'm, I'm totally estranged from those people. So what can I tell you? Am I, am I failing to answer the question? I think, no, I like that. That's healthy that you have different perspectives. I'm not at all like, okay, well, I mean, I just offended or something, you know, I just think that question, like, who knows you best? Like I have to say, what's an interesting aspect, question. What, okay. But I, I, and I'm answering it by saying what aspect of me knows what, like me as I am now, or me as I was, of course, like people that I've met later, they don't know, uh, what I was like growing up, but you know, if I took them back to my hometown, if you want to call it that, or if I took them to Houston and showed them places where I lived and worked and, you know, hung out and so on, they could understand more. Of course, it's not the same as being there at the time. But I'm just trying that, to say that does that mean it takes time to develop comfort with people? Well, absolutely. I don't, I don't disagree with that. But, you know... And to create like a common language. All and right, like a... but also, well, sure. But also longevity of acquaintanceship is no guarantee of intimacy at the no, same time. No, it's not, but... Yeah. In fact, it's it, not, can, it just... can often be... It can often lead to the opposite. You know, familiarity breeds contempt, as they say. That, yeah. uh, that also happens. I just, I don't sentimentalize that. You know, like, oh he's from my hometown or she's the girl next door. Fuck off with all that. I don't care. I'm just observing though. Even like, even if we take away the, the judgment of like this being better than something else, it can be something as simple as like, I've chosen to be an expat. There are a lot of things that are cool about being an expat. And one thing that you could argue is, a challenge or something that you sacrifice is quality of friendship or, you know, the, like, uh, I do think that I see what you're getting at now. Um, I don't know, like, does being an expat, um, necessitate having more casual friendships less intimate it can create stronger bonds i'm I just agree. Tr- saying I that agree. I, and when fact, you move would say, you have to start over well That's my point. okay but i would say the people i met during my first year in korea some of them have become i, I shouldn't say some of them maybe only one of them um but, you know, one or two of them have become like some of the most important and influential people in my life. One of them I have remained close to and we talk regularly. One, um, we we communicated by email. We hadn't talked face to face for like 18 years and we recently did a podcast and it was like we were in Seoul again talking after work. you were in korea 18 know. years ago bro mm-hmm. holy fuck yep making me feel old yep so uh there is something about and that that first year of being an expat that was one of the best years of my life with all of its ups and downs and that was before i met you like that yeah i think i met you my second year there so it was mm-hmm. already different the second year like it was I was already um, accustomed to it. Like the first year, everything is so new and intense and unbelievable, right? It's really right, so like what a are you rebirth. willing to get nostalgic about? <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know. With anything from whether it be past friendship or like what, do, what is something that you will allow yourself to to sentimentalize about? About friendship in the past. 
Because nostalgia is not a bad thing, right? It can be a sweet thing, and it can be well. Etymologically, poetic. it's the the pain of return, but uh, it can be okay. it can be bittersweet, right? Um, I'm I, at the same time. I'm not. I'm not saying I have no fond memories. You know, I'm not saying that. Sure, but what what do you what can you feel? What can you feel wistful about without? And again, I, f I would argue that you can feel wistful or nostalgic without that being any kind of negative judgment on your present incarnation. Well, if we're talking, if we're talking about the teenage years, I think the the happiest times for me were when I was with that group of friends that was playing music and experimenting with marijuana and LSD, tripping. You know, getting high, listening to music, having philosophical conversations, opening our minds to the 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 possibilities of the wider world. You know, realizing that oh, we're just in this tiny little Southeast Texas community. This is not the whole world. Not everyone is a fucking cowboy. Not everyone is concerned only about football you know it's like we can we can listen to dark side of the moon we can listen to the white album uh we can try to write songs of our own we can create something you know we can make music that's that was very important to me um, yeah, when you say that music for me is, you you know, music plays a very prominent role in your life still because you're constantly creating. But as far as like the listening experience, I still put a lot of effort into making sure music is part of my life, but it's nowhere near as powerful for me as it used to be in terms of, first of all, me keeping up with what's going on. Second, like I don't smoke weed anymore and like a lot of my... I had so many incredible music listening experiences, mainly at university, but just like, you know, listening to hip hop high and just having the the lyrics just come out at me, just really well, like I was there in the booth. Well, you know, there is something about the communal experience of listening to music with other people, right? Like, where do we get that now? It's not like... um we can often hang out and listen to records. We don't even do that. We have like a streaming service. Okay, you could still hang out and listen to an album on Spotify and skip the ads. I, mean, I have if vinyl, don't... to be fair, and, and I've listened to vinyl with, with friends okay, on yeah. very rare occasions. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. It's it's possible, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it's more difficult to make it happen, probably. Um, but I don't, I don't know, maybe not for you. For me, it, it is. Um, but you can still go to a concert and enjoy music with strangers, I guess, or go with friends. Um, but just talking about it is a joy for me. I like talking about music. I like, uh, you know, discussing favorite albums with someone who also loves that particular album and going track by track and analyzing it so maybe all of this is a result of the of that early teenage experience of doing the same thing right like when we're okay. listening we're we're analyzing we're trying to understand we're trying to incorporate bits of what we're hearing into our own creative efforts um so yeah but i keep that communal experience alive i see you with your finger raised but i'm going to complete I'm trying this to avoid the interruption vibe. i'm going to complete this thought i keep Please. that i keep that communal experience of music alive by playing with other musicians now who are performing my songs like that is a joy to me to to present this this song that i've written and then fleshing out the arrangement uh, the arrangements with other master musicians, you know? I'm sure that feels amazing, no doubt. 
So my question was just going to be, I can't, and again, maybe I could say that's medication even speaking, but I can't get the same ecstasy from music as I could as a 16-year-old or 20-year-old. Well, or that's even, a whole, that's can a you? whole, that's a whole other conversation. I mean, well, that's what I'm asking you. Like, if well, you listen, can you get the same? Not. Maybe not. It did. We're more jaded. Um, we've heard it all before. At the time I discovered that stuff, it was just an unbelievable experience. Now we right. think. Now we think we've seen it all and heard it all and done it all. So I don't think that's true. But it, it's. Harder. I don't know if it's jaded though. I it's harder it's... to find. It's harder to find something that blows our minds, like, you know, maybe it did yeah. then. But, uh, but I think maybe that's because of not necessarily jaded, but just just part of being experience. a youth. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But we should still. But I think I'm still chasing that. I think that's why I'm still involved in music. I'm still writing songs and recording them and and playing with people. Because yeah, I, music I want can that. be very fulfilling. I Agreed. want that. I want that experience that I had as a teen. You know, but isn't it kind of disappointing that we can't really get it? I mean, maybe you, you're in a band, so again, it's different. Well, I but... think I think sometimes I do, <laughs> whether anyone else realizes it or not. Like when I have a breakthrough, when I when I play something new and unexpected on bass or when I sing something or come up with a background vocal part that I hadn't anticipated or I I write you know or I you know come up with a new chord structure or use a different chord or whatever it is a, a break no it makes with, sense actually with because when lyrics. I do lyrics yeah when I was rapping, it was the same. So I, I could still definitely get really high. And I, I was rapping until, I don't know, 10 years ago. So it wasn't that long or, you know, or eight yeah, years but ago. It's, so. the, it's the same thing with with writing, you know, when you find a new way of yeah. expressing something or, uh, you know, when I start a new book and try to do something different, always trying to make it new as Ezra Pound recommended um that's why you keep doing it right you're always trying to experience that ecstasy which which yeah maybe... i think my melancholy is just coming from the fact that i don't set aside the time or i can't set aside the time somewhere in between those two words to on the on the purely creative process you know so well, I, anyway, I would just to, to relate it back to our text. I would just say that my my earliest experiences of that type of ecstasy, whether through music or you know in my late teens through literature too, that it it's all um, rooted in that time period, you know. So maybe. Maybe I'm, uh, I played music with a guy in Korea who, you know, in his 40s was saying, I'm still a teenager at heart. Like I never grew up. And I, I feel that too. I still do. I can have, relate to that too. I still I do can have the same kind of excitement, you know, in my 50s. I still have the same excitement that I had as a teenager. Like whether it be about a new song or a new book. And so, in that sense, I'm yeah. still still in certain living. aspects of life. I feel that I'm sure. still living my teenage life, and it's sure. with other things too. Like it could be a new film or a new uh, uh, place I haven't traveled to. You know, so no, I mean your zest for life is one of your best qualities. Yeah, even though I'm I'm also prone to melancholy and and cynicism and depression, but you know, I still also am always in pursuit of the ecstatic experience and connection. So. Should we wrap it up there? Oh, definitely. We've gone on long enough. 
So um, okay, yeah, I would just. Well, say if anyone that, wants to share, yeah, go on. Yeah, you you carry on. I was gonna encourage okay. listeners to share their own experiences. And even if you don't share, I hope that us talking about our experiences maybe jogged something in your memory which you hadn't thought about for a while, which kind of gives you a a moment momentary poetic feeling or a nice moment of memory. Um, memory itself is a pretty psychedelic experience. So that's why I kind of wanted to talk about it today, just because it's, you know, going into the memories is, is just a, a very rich pool of, of stuff that we often just don't find time to pay homage to. Well, memory is the mother of the muses, but maybe we should save that for an episode on Proust. Um, sure. The next episode will be, unless I change my mind, the next episode will be a documentary called Mark Lombardi, Death Defying Acts of Art and Conspiracy. So Mark Lombardi was an artist and uh, this film is a documentary about his life and work. Um, he died in 2001, uh, in 2000, I guess it was, under mysterious circumstances. And uh, we'll get into that next time. This will be a new text for you, right? Yeah, and I'm I'm excited just from the the brief preview you've given and a very perfunctory glance at some of his work. Yeah. All right. Do we dare so, drop an R.I.P. Navalny at the end of this episode? Well, uh, I don't know much about that, but you can say whatever you want. Well, I just commend his courage uh, to dedicate himself to something without saying much more and uh yeah peace okay. to those who loved him okay well we can consider discussing that at greater length later maybe we'll <laughs> do it or know, not. maybe we'll do an emergency episode on on that I'll it's have just to... an interesting time stamp so know that today on february 17th 2024 you know, this thing happens. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to if research else. his life and politics more, but um, I'd be willing to do that if you want to have a lengthy conversation about it. I think I need a break from uh, Russian politics. I'm also okay with that. <laughs> All right. So thanks everyone for listening. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, donate. Um, I don't know how you would donate. I do have a Patreon, but um, I'll have to find the link to that later. But uh, like and subscribe, comment, and uh, you're making faces. I don't know what that means. Uh, Nothing, just for fun. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I'm at markwillwrite.substack.com. That's markwillwrite.substack.com. And Tomek is at Tomek b.substack.com so hit us up there and let us know what you think and we'll see you next time dosvidanya